Welcome to the lecture for Basics of Biblical Aramaic, Chapter 1. In this chapter, we'll cover the Aramaic alphabet. Now, the good news is, is that the Aramaic alphabet is identical to the Hebrew alphabet, and this grammar assumes that you've studied at least a year of Hebrew before taking up Aramaic. Thus, everything you know about the Hebrew alphabet is also going to apply to your knowledge of the Aramaic alphabet. Let's take a look at Daniel 2.4 just by way of illustrating this. In Daniel 2.4, you're going to see a number of different things, black text, red text, and blue text. The black and red text represent Hebrew. It is translated, the Chaldeans spoke to the king Aramith, or Aramaic. That's the Hebrew word for Aramaic. Then you'll see three lines of blue text. That's all Aramaic text. What you'll observe is that the consonants, the vowels, and the accent system are identical for both Aramaic and Hebrew. So everything you know about Hebrew in those categories of consonants, vowels, and accents will also apply to your knowledge and study of Aramaic at this point. So let's just take a second and review some of the basics of the Hebrew alphabet that will become important for your study of Aramaic. Look at your screen with me. Hebrew and Aramaic, like I've said, use the same alphabet. There are 23 letters written from right to left, beginning with Aleph and moving all the way through Tau. If you were at all rusty with your knowledge of the Hebrew alphabet, then you need to pause and make sure you shore up your knowledge of this Aramaic alphabet. They're the same. You must know how to write out these 23 letters in order from right to left. You must know the names of each of these letters, and you must know how to represent these letters in pronunciation. Without this knowledge, learning the language is almost impossible. So it's very important to go through this step and to say, yes, the Hebrew alphabet and the Aramaic alphabet are the same, but... If you're rusty on your knowledge of the Hebrew alphabet, you're going to be rusty on your knowledge of the Aramaic alphabet, and you must shore up that knowledge. In addition to sharing the same alphabet, they also share many of the same peculiarities embedded in that alphabet. Both Hebrew and Aramaic have five different consonants that have two different forms, both a regular form and a final form. Look at your screen with me. You will see and recognize five letters in the left-hand column here that appear as the regular forms of the alphabet, the kaf, the mem, the nun, the pe, and the tzade. In the middle column, you'll recognize, I hope, five final forms. Again, the kaf, the mem, the nun, the pe, and the tzade. The regular form is the form of the consonant used at the beginning or anywhere in the middle of a word. The final form is the form of that particular consonant used as the last letter in any form. Now, you can imagine with a language that was written really close together and sometimes without any spaces, having final forms would have been really helpful because they would serve as word dividers. Well, those things and those features still carry over today, even though we use spaces in our text. And so you must be able to recognize and write out these five final forms. So let's look at them again. In the example column on the very right, you can see the five final forms in action. For example, in the first word, melech you see the final kaf with a shawa in it. Or in the second example, yom, you'll see the final mim. Or shemayan, the final noon. Kasaf, the final pe, And karatz, the final tzade. These are the five final forms that you must memorize before you move on. Now hopefully, you already have these in your brain, but if not, take time to know exactly how they're written and where they appear at the end of a word. Hebrew and Aramaic also share the six so-called begad kafat consonants. Now, the begad kafat consonants are those consonants that have not two forms, but two sounds, a soft sound and a hard sound. And the way you distinguish between a begad kafat and having a soft sound and a hard sound is the presence or absence of the dogish lene in the begad kafat consonant. The dogish lene is that small dot that appears in the middle of the consonant. Look at your screen with me. You'll see two columns of consonants. Those are the six begad kafat consonants. The bait, the gimel, the dalit, the kaf, the pe, and the tau. The column on the left represents those six forms without a dogish lene, and so the softer pronunciations. So, for example, the bait without a dogish lene is pronounced softly like a v, v. But look at the right column. Now you'll see the six begad kafat consonants with a dogish lene in the middle of each consonant. That dogish lene hardens. You can think of it as a catalyst. It hardens the pronunciation. So if the bait without the dogish lene is pronounced softly with a V, V, the bait with the dogish lene is pronounced hard 
like the B in boy, ba. Listen to the difference, va without the doggish lane, and ba with the doggish lane. The difference between something like vest with the V sound and boy with the B sound. You must be able to distinguish between these two uh, pronunciation systems, that is, those forms with the doggish lane and those forms without the doggish lane. Knowing how to do this will help you how to accurately pronounce Aramaic words. And if you can accurately pronounce Aramaic words, it helps both in your reading fluency and in your memorization of scriptures if you're inclined to memorize. Another feature that both Hebrew and Aramaic share is the guttural consonant system. Look at your screen with me. Both Hebrew and Aramaic have four guttural consonants and one semi-guttural consonant. The four guttural consonants you'll see appear in red. They are Aleph, He, Chet, and Ayin. The one semi-guttural consonant appears in blue, and it is Resh. The Resh is a semi-guttural because sometimes it acts like a guttural consonant, and sometimes it acts like a non-guttural consonant. It shares things in common with both gutturals and non-gutturals. For example, you can't put a doggish forte in the Resh, but you can put a vocal schwa underneath it at times. And so, it, in some sense, is a guttural and a non-guttural, so they call it a semi-guttural. Now, all five of these guttural consonants do share features in common. And so if you don't know these, I'm going to review them quickly for you. And we'll keep rehearsing them throughout the grammar because this, this feature of the language with the guttural consonant is helpful. One, gutturals prefer A-class vowels. Gutturals prefer A-class vowels. And so even when you would expect to see an E-class or an I-class or an O-class vowel somewhere, you may see that vowel changing because of the guttural consonant. Gutturals prefer A-class vowels. Secondly, gutturals will not be doubled. They don't like their, their weaker consonants, so they don't like double weaknesses. And so you can't put a doggish forte into a guttural consonant. So doggish fortes will be rejected by guttural consonants. And sometimes you'll get things like virtual doubling or compensatory lengthening to compensate for that particular feature. And then finally, guttural consonants don't like to take vocal schwa, and so they take hatef vowels. And so when you would expect a vocal schwa on a particular word, you're not going to see that pure vocal schwa. You're going to see something like a hatef pathic or hatef segol. So three things you need to know about these guttural consonants. Prefer A-class vowels, no doggish forte, and no vocal schwa. They prefer the hatef vowels. Keep those things in mind as you're working through the grammar, and some of the changes you see later will be things that you'll already be um, trained to expect. In addition to all of the ways in which Hebrew and Aramaic are the same, there are a few ways in which Hebrew and Aramaic are different. And this is due primarily because both Hebrew and Aramaic, though related, are different dialectically. And so we're going to see features that are the same or remind us of something we know in Hebrew, but are slightly different in Aramaic because of the dialectical differences. Think for a minute of all the different ways English is spoken in our world. There's, there's that brand of English spoken in Australia and that brand of English spoken in America and that brand of English spoken in England. All three use the same language, but in slightly different ways, sometimes slightly different sounds and representations slightly different emphasis in places. And so we're going to see that happening and factoring into our understanding of Aramaic, which makes Aramaic and Hebrew more interesting, more real for us. Look at your screen with me. The first thing that we're going to see are consonantal variations based upon dialectical differences. There are three consonants in Hebrew that may be represented differently in Aramaic. Now, these consonants are related Hebrew to Aramaic, but they are represented differently in the Aramaic system. Understanding these differences, these slight differences, the intention is going to be to help you build your vocabulary without thinking you're memorizing new words every time. Hebrew has three consonants, the Zion, the Sade, and the Shin, that may be represented in four different ways in Aramaic. The Hebrew Zion may be represented by the Aramaic Dalit. Look at the examples with me. Here you'll see the Hebrew word for gold, Zahav. To the right of it, in the Aramaic column, you'll see the same word in Aramaic for gold, but it's not spelled with Zion, it's spelled with Dalit, the have. The difference between the Zion and the Dalit in Hebrew and in Aramaic is based on its dialectical difference. Now, if you can connect the Zion and the Dalit in your mind by memorizing that particular change, you're going to be able to reduce the strain in vocabulary memorization. So look at your screen again with me, and you'll see in the Hebrew column, that the Hebrew tzadeh can be represented either as tet or as ayin in the Aramaic system. Look at the two Hebrew examples. We have tzur, the Hebrew word for rock, and eretz, the Hebrew word for land. In the Aramaic column to the right, you're going to see those same two words, but represented in the first case with tet, tzur becoming tur, and in the second case with eretz becoming ar-ah. 
In each instance, the sadhis become something slightly different. In the first example, tet. In the second example, ayin. Finally, in the last row, you'll observe that the Hebrew shin can be represented by the tau in Aramaic, the sh to the th sound. Look at the example. Here you see the Hebrew verb yeshav, to sit. In Aramaic, it's represented not with a shin as the second root letter, but as a tau in the second root letter, yathiv. Once again, the shin may be represented as tau. Now, this may seem odd at first, but it really does help, and it's worth noting. One of the things you're going to see in both Hebrew and Aramaic when you compare them is that it's not always one-to-one. There's not always identity. Sometimes there's identity with slight nuance and difference. And if you can learn to realize those nuances and those differences, then Aramaic becomes much less difficult to memorize. You can see its relationship. It's like a brother or a sister or a cousin. You can see the family relationship. And the more connections you can draw together in the language, the better it will be for your memorization. You'll reinforce Hebrew and you'll learn Aramaic faster. Now, in addition to consonantal variation based on dialectical differences, we also have consonantal variation based on spelling differences. Look at your screen with me. One of the things in Aramaic that may seem odd at first is that the spelling is not always set for a particular word. And there are a number of instances where the same word may be spelled in one of two different ways. The first interchangeable consonant pair is Aleph and He. You'll see two examples to the right. You'll see the word La as example one spelled Lamed, Comets Aleph. And you'll see the exact same word in example two, but spelled Lamed, Comets He. This is the negative particle in Aramaic. It would be equivalent to the negative particle Lo in Hebrew. But you can see in Aramaic it's spelled in one of two different ways with Aleph or with He. For some reason, Aramaic had not set the convention for how it represent the final A sound at, in every instance. So the first pair of interchangeable consonants is Aleph and He, and you're going to see that one occurring a lot in biblical Aramaic. But look at the next row. You'll see Sin and Psalmic, the two S sounds in Aramaic. Like Aleph and He above, the Sin and the Psalmic may be used interchangeably in a word for spelling variation. So you can see, here's one of the words for the musical instruments that appears in the book of Daniel, the sabka. You can see in example one that it's spelled with a sin, but in example two, it's spelled with a psalmic. Now the reason for this is that in some instances, the sounds and the, the spelling was going through a conversion period, and they were just representing them in different ways. It's like um, spelling the English word cat, C-A-T, versus K-A-T. All right. Now we understand the differences. Both words sound the same. Both words mean the same, but one has a correct spelling and one has an incorrect spelling. In Aramaic, they're both considered correct. So They like the adage of Mark Twain who once said, I have no patience for a man who can spell a word only one way. And he must have been thinking about Aramaic because Aramaic exhibits a lot of words that can be spelled in multiple ways. And we're going to encounter those words as we progress through the study of the grammar. This brings us to the end of our study of chapter 1 where we've in some sense mastered the fundamentals of the Aramaic alphabet system. We've talked about the 23 letters of the Aramaic alphabet and how they're identical to Hebrew, written from right to left. Hebrew and Aramaic exhibit the same five final forms, begad kafat consonants, and guttural consonants. All of this information should be reviewed to you, and if you have not reviewed it, or if it's a little bit rusty, you need to go back and make sure all of these items are sharp in your mind. In addition to those items that are the same, we've also talked about a number of items that are different. Make sure you review what you already know and that you carefully memorize the new material in the grammar, both the consonantal variation and the spelling variation. If you master this now, your reading fluency and your ability to take on the Aramaic language later will be that much easier. So look at your screen with me. Before you move on, you should review the alphabet, including the final forms, the gad kafat consonants, and the guttural consonants. Now, this is the easy stuff. It's the review, so make sure that you know it well. But look at the second point. Carefully study the issue of consonantal variation presented in 1.5 of the grammar. Understanding this section will help with Aramaic vocabulary and reduce the workload of memorizing new vocabulary. Now, it may sound odd at the beginning to tell you to really focus on this material that seems so minor, but it's really these minor issues that will really help build Aramaic vocabulary and reading fluency faster. If you're always confused or tripped up by these variations, you'll be frustrated by the language. And so by taking this on now when you have time and there's not much new stuff to learn, you're really going to increase your fluency and proficiency in the language. 
Well, that brings us to the end of chapter one. Next in chapter two, we'll cover the Aramaic vowel system.